Hello everyone, welcome to the Statistics of Collections, which is a rather grand title, uh, but uh, really we're just talking about how collections are doing, where we've come from, where we're going to, that kind of thing. Let me introduce myself. Uh, many of you will know who I am from previous talks, but uh, we have a much wider audience at FEST this year than we're used to, and certainly a larger attendance than we've had at previous virtual contributor summits. My name is Greg Sutcliffe, and I have the honor of being the Ansible Community Data Scientist, which essentially means I build tools for you wonderful folks. My goal is to help the Ansible community to understand its data better and to grow uh, and to make use of that data to make good decisions. And we're going to look today at one of the biggest decisions we made in the past couple of years, which is the move to collections. So I'm going to go over some of the data around why we had to do the move to collections, what that move actually entailed and its consequences, what those consequences imply for what we want to look at today, and also where I want to get to in the future. And I'm going to finish with a couple of tools you can go and play with and have a look for yourself. So where were we? Two years ago, or maybe less than two years ago, um, you know, 2018 into 2019, all of the content for the Ansible community was in Ansible Ansible. Uh, and specifically, it was in LibAnsible, uh, LibAnsible modules, uh, and also module utils, I guess, for plugins. And things were not great. We had something in the region of 1,000 to 1,500, nearly 1,500 PRs by mid-2019. Um, that's really not good. Um, JP Menz wrote a fantastic blog post last year about how it was all horrible trying to contribute to Ansible at the moment, and he was largely right. Um, it was horrible. I mean, the time to merge was something like 50 days. Um, and I'll come back to time to merge later in the talk because I don't agree with how time to merge is usually calculated in our industry. Um, I have what I feel to be a more realistic number. And that number was somewhere in the region of um, 50 days in 2018 and more like 70 to 80 days by mid 2019 and still increasing. So we had a large number of pull requests. We had the time to merge those pull requests increasing. It was just... It was it was not sustainable, and and the problem was not just quantity, but also just a structural nature that arises from having everything in a single Git repo. You you're, you're very constrained, and uh, once you get to that kind of scale, if you go and look at the list of pull requests, page after page after page of those pull requests is not relevant to the bit that you, as a maintainer of a particular module, you want to maintain your code, and most of the pull requests don't pertain to that, right? So, as a maintainer. You want your own release schedules, you want your own workflows, you want to be able to work on stuff that's actually relevant. Um, and you can't because, I mean, yes, okay, GitHub has filters, but there's limits, right? And and so we were really struggling um, with getting the work done. And, and it shows. It shows both in the rising number of pull requests and the rising time to merge. What you're seeing here on this graph is uh, a forecast I did in March of this year. This was a retrospective um, after the decision to move to collections had been taken. Um, but I felt it was important to understand and to talk about why we did it. And, and this is just me kind of recapping it. You can read the whole blog post. This was the final forecast of a set of time series models that I built. And you can see that even the most conservative of those models, the blue lines are the models, even the most conservative shows over 1500 PRs by mid 2020. And by and most models were going over 3,000 by the end of 2020. And that's that's just not good. It's not good for the community. And so something had to be done. Now, what are we going to do? I think you already know the answer to that, right? We're talking about collections. Now, collections conceptually aren't that big a thing, right? Before we had lib Ansible modules, and it had some subdirectories and maybe some more subdirectories and then a bunch of Python files. And that's all it was, it's files in directories. And afterwards, we had a bunch of Git repositories, most of them in GitHub under Ansible Collections, but in other places as well. But if you were to clone all of them onto disk, you'd have a bunch of directories with Python files in. It's not that big a deal for me as the data scientist. It makes very little difference to how I collect the data on our code base. But the change semantically, the change for the community was enormous, right? And it was enormous in two ways. The first was for maintainers. For maintainers, this is great, right? Because you can set, if, you, if you're a maintainer with your own repository now, you can set your own release schedules, set your own workflows, 
handle your own issue templates, do your own troubleshooting. You know that every issue raised there is relevant to your code base. It's all there for you to deal with. And that's just such a big boost. However, as the core team that made this decision, as the community team, we knew this was going to have a hit to contributors. I mean, we're not naive. We didn't just pull a lever and think, ah, this will be fine. We knew this was going to cause a hit because it's not fun to have to reopen your PRs in a different repository. It's not fun to have your PR closed in front of you and say, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to move this somewhere else. If it's still a problem, please take it to this repository. It's not fun to lose your Git history. It's just not fun. But we had to do something. And this was the thing we did, and we studied. I actually was tasked with doing a piece of work earlier this year where I actually studied how people contribute to the various collections, or not the collections, but the subdirectories within the Ansible modules, so that we could see how to break out the collections whilst inconveniencing people as little as possible. What I managed to show from that was that the vast majority of contributors actually only contribute to one or two modules and mostly within a single directory of low balanceable modules, which made it very easy for us to say, okay, we can break all these out into separate repositories and most people aren't going to be too inconvenienced. Yes, there will be some people who are contributing to four, five, six different collections and now have four, five, six different Git repositories to track, but they're 5% of the community. So that was useful work done. That's one of the ways in which I tried to help as a data scientist. In any case, the decision was taken and it was done. But that leads to some questions. Ultimately, we're going to want to know, did it work, right? So there's really three questions I think we need to start thinking about. Well, I say start thinking about. I've already been thinking about them for some time. Wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't. First question we've got to answer is this. We know there's a hit to contributors. How are we doing in bringing more, either getting people back or bringing new contributors in? I don't like identifying people personally. I think that's a bit of an invasion. But in aggregate, in numbers of contributors, how are we doing? compared to where Ansible Ansible was when we did the shift. The second question we're going to have to answer is about Community General. Now, Community General is a bit of a special case, and I'll explain why in a moment. And finally, there's stats for the individual collections. Are they doing okay? Are they healthy? Right? We, need, we need to help maintainers more than anything to, to run their communities um, and, or sub-communities. I don't even know what the right word is here. Is it communities of communities? It's a bit nested. In any case, stats for collections is going to be important because ultimately I want to help maintainers, but also for, for myself and for Gundalo we want, and for the rest of our team here in the community, we want to be able to look at the whole set of collections and answer questions about that. And so gathering data on individual collections and then summing that up into some kind of table is going to be important. Let's start with regaining contributor numbers. As I say, I don't like identifying people individually. However, I do think it's important uh, to look at the total. So what you're looking at here is uh, a set of graphs, one per collection. And for each collection, we've identified an area, uh, a path, in libansible modules that relates to that collection. So it might be in something like um, monitoring slash Zabbix or something like that, right? And what we can do is we can look at the commits to just that directory inside libansible modules. So that means historically, I can take a slice of time from Ansible Ansible, and I've, I've taken a year from September 2018 to August 2019. Why? Because in September 2019, we announced collections and everything changed. <laughs> so the data is only you know, valid up until about August 2019. So we have a year of data from core, and we can look at the contributors to a given file path. Right? And that gives us a number of people. Roughly, it's a bit crude. Some of the file paths don't map cleanly to some of the collections. But largely speaking, we can map a number of unique contributors to a particular path in lib Ansible modules. We can then compare that to the number of unique contributors in the collection itself, as of right now. Now, this is not a completely fair collection uh, comparison yet, because we have got one year of data from core and only six months of data from the collections, because they only really started to become created in March this year. So we've only got six months of collections data. We've got a year's worth of Ansible data. So we're not 
able to do a, a fair comparison yet. Okay, yes, I could use six months of data from Core, but it's lower numbers and it gets noisier and I'd rather just wait. I can, however, give you a report. And as you can see, these numbers are encouraging. You know, we've got the top nine by percentage. So it's, so it's a percentage, right, in the sense that the number of contributors to the collection divided by the number of contributors historically to Core for that collection is a percentage. It's a percentage of Core. Right, and you can see they're starting to approach 100%. I mean, Zabbix is currently at something like 23 out of 25, so very close to 100%. And this is the top nine. There's a lot more. There's 49 collections I'm tracking, which I know is not everything that's in 2.10, but this is you know there's reasons for that, and um, mostly I get the list of what I should track from Gundalo. So if you think you should be on the list, you can talk to him. If you want to go and look at the full list, including collections that don't map to a historical number like Community General. Um, then you can go and look at that link, and uh, that will show you everything. Uh, but I'm just taking the top nine here, and you can see they're all above 50%. So this is encouraging. People are moving back in. We're getting numbers up. I hope that by the time we get to one year out, so March next year, uh, we'll be seeing that most of these are over 100%, and certainly the aggregate is over 100%. That's my hope, because the idea here is to scale the community beyond what Core could support. So this is one of the ways in which we'll be checking that. But for now, this sign is encouraging, and I like where this is going, and you're welcome to go and have a look at it. If your collection is not on there and you think it should be, get in touch with myself or Gundalo, we can make that happen. Let me talk now about Community General and why it's a special case. See, Community General is defined as the home for content that has no home. If you don't have a dedicated collection like Grafana or Zabbix or VMware or, or anything else to go to, then you're probably in Community General. And that's fine, it needs to exist. But because it needs to exist, it's a, effectively a clone of what we had in Core Ansible Ansible, because that was the home for everything before. This is now the home for everything that doesn't have a better home, but it's still a mishmash of various types of content. It still has to be run by a bot. It's got a lot of the same restrictions, uh, restrictions on it that we had on Core. And so we have to keep a very close eye on it. We do not want to see a spiraling backlog, rising time to merge, all the problems that we saw in core. We want to catch those early. We do have more levers to pull now that we did not have before. Because we have the collections infrastructure in place, it is always possible for content in Community General to be moved out into its own collection. If we see a rising number of PRs related to a particular topic, then we can try and find some maintainers and get that moved out into its own collection so that it can be properly maintained in a way that's compatible and easier to manage. That's a good lever to have. The other lever we've got, which is a bit more easy to pull now, we had it before, but it's easier to pull it now, is things like PR days or bug squash days, trying to just spend a bit of extra effort on Community General when it looks like it needs it. And again, you can't pull those levers if you can't see that it needs to happen. So, what we're looking at here is the change in the backlog. Turns out that's far more interesting. If you think about the backlog, it's rising all the time. It's got a valid number, you know, it's X, whatever it is. On a daily basis, that will change. And it's the change that matters. So if you think about the number of PRs that have been opened in a day, and you subtract off the number that were closed, you've got a change in the backlog, and that can be positive or negative. And from a statistical perspective, which is what I do, um, having numbers that can go either side of zero makes life a lot easier. <laughs> You can deal with things that have to be positive, and it's not too difficult, but it's better if we can just deal with a nice distribution of numbers. And if you think about that, it's almost certainly a Gaussian distribution as well. So we've got some number, we've got some distribution of possible values for the change in the backlog every day, and the question we want to ask ourselves is, is it positive? Is the mean of that distribution positive? Why do we want to ask that? Well, it corresponds to the slope in this graph. This graph is um, the, back, the change in the backlog, and we want to know if it's flat right? If the backlog is not going up and up and up and up and up. If the mean of that distribution is zero, this graph is flat. Now, if you think about it for a minute, you'll know that it can't be negative, at least not for too long, because eventually you'd run out of PRs. Negative means it's going down, right? And so eventually you get to zero, and it would have to stop being negative at that point. But it can be sustained positive, And that's the thing we want to watch out for. Because if it's sustained positive and largely positive, then we have an issue. And that's when we need to jump in and start thinking about what we're going to do about it. Now, it's quite hard to see from this graph whether or not it is actually positive. Now, we could put a line through that. Right? I could put a linear regression, straight line fit through that. The problem with straight line fits, statistically, is they don't do so well at the edges. 
They're very happy with the center of the line. They're less happy with the edges. And it's the edges I care about because I'm really interested in those last three dots because that's the most recent data. So I want to do something different. And so what we do instead is we, we plot a distribution. We just turn it into a histogram. How many times have we seen each value? And we look at it and we put a nice Gaussian curve on there with a mean. And currently this data is as of today, uh, which today is the 30th of September. The mean is currently 2.5. That's high, but it's not super high. The question we're really at, we're, the, the, the slope will never be zero, right? I mean, that's just chance. Um, there'll always be some variation. The question we really need to ask is, is zero plausible? Is zero, a mean of zero, compatible with the data that we're seeing? And right now, looking at that curve, looking at how broad it is, looking at how close the mean is to it, I'd say it is. I'd say we've not got too much to worry about right now. And if we go back and compare that new information to this graph, it makes sense. It looks like the PR, the number of PRs is rising, but not very much. There was a few blue dots there. Blue means it was negative, it, it went down. Uh, I'm not too worried about that. If you'd asked me this in August, when you had that very steep rise, I'd have been a lot more concerned. But now it looks like it's okay. So this is a graph I keep a close eye on and I report it back to Gundalo from time to time. And if it looks like it's getting out of control, I will make a point of it. It's important, it matters. But it's a good way to track where Community General is at and to stop it from repeating the mistakes of the past, which is absolutely the most critical thing. Okay, the other thing we're gonna care about with Community General is it's time to merge. And to talk about that, I need to make a little rant. So I hope you'll indulge me for a minute while I talk about time to close metrics. Now you see, I really, really, really don't like time to close metrics as they are usually represented, and I'll explain why. They nearly always underrepresent the true value. Let me give you some hypothetical, completely made up data here. Suppose I have a bunch of pull requests or issues or any other events you want to study. So they, people submit them at random times, so you can see the left-hand edge. So every one of those lines is a pull request and how long it's been open, right? So intuitively, you can see that um, some lines are longer than the others, so they've been open for longer. At time zero, today, I'm gonna to look at the state of my repo. And what I'm gonna see is that I've got six issues that have been closed, that's the red ones, and four issues that are still open, that's the blue ones. What do I do? Now, what most people will do is take a mean but how do you take a mean of the issues that are still open? Well, there's a couple of options. You could just ignore them. If you ignore them, you get the first value in that table. You get a mean of 6.4 days. That's how. That's your time to close, 6.4 days. That is the mean of the red lines, how long they were open for. 6.4 days. Sounds good. It's not true, though. <laughs> if you take a slightly more nuanced view and say, well, I don't want to ignore the open issues. They're valid information. Maybe I'll set their end date to now and calculate the mean as if they were closed at this very second, well, then you get the answer 7.8. Still wrong. Actually, if we were to wait until those issues were closed and then go back and look at the data, we'd find that the actual time to close is 10.5. So if you just take the most naive view of dropping the open issues and taking a mean of the closed ones, you get an answer that's not far off half of the true value, very underrepresented. And this is, this is an endemic problem. Um, you can be more nuanced. You can use the median instead of the mean, and that is better. And specifically, if you do the median where you set the open issues equal to now, that's line two on that table, that will often get you the right answer under certain circumstances, but it's not guaranteed to. Uh, so just take, take care. However, all is not lost. There is a better way of doing this, which I'm going to introduce to you now. And that is a tool called survival analysis. And it looks like this. You plot the the PRs. Here I've got both PRs and issues, um, just to show the, the difference. Uh, the blue line is PRs, uh, the pink line is issues for a particular repository. I think this was Grafana. The dotted line that you see is the median, and they're summarized in the table on the right as well. Uh, so the median, the 50% chance of having your pull request merged, is 0.6 of a day. That's pretty fast. I have to hats off to the Grafana community uh, for that, uh, because that's impressive. To be clear, when I say Grafana community, I'm talking about the Grafana Ansible collection, not Grafana itself. And then the closing issues on a median of just under two weeks, which is still pretty good for issues when you think about it. You expect issues to be longer than pull requests because you've got to do troubleshooting, collect more information from the user. They generally take longer and that's fine. But 
What I like about survival curves is this. You don't have to pick 50%. And I think intuitively, as community people, that makes sense. Do I want half of my community to have a good time? To have a fast merge time? I don't think that's a very fair way of looking at it. I think it would be far nicer if we said something like, 80% of our community have a good experience and get their issue dealt with in a fast time. And actually, that means survival analysis is really good because you can pick any point on the curve that you like. So for example, I can come up here and I can say, well, what if I care about three quarters of my community having a good experience? Well, that's gonna be something like five days for pull requests. And hmm, this is the problem with step functions, right? Uh, I've got to pick somewhere on this line. So let's say it's something like, two months for issues. So I would say that that's really nice for pull requests, like three, four, five days for pull requests. Great, two months for issues, eh, maybe some work to do there. But I wouldn't know that by just taking a mean. And you can pick any value you like, right? And as a maintainer, this is super useful because all you really need to learn to do is look at where the elbow in that curve is. Where does it bend sharply? Like, he, it's about here. It's about here for pull requests. So somewhere around about 80 to 85% of them are gonna be merged in a decent amount of time, and then you've always got that long tail of things that just drag on forever, and that's fine. That's where, you know, the maintainer is fine, but the person who submitted it has wandered off, or, um, or there's an issue with the CI, or it's a complicated thing that just needs a lot of discussion, which does happen, right? Not every pull request is going to be fast. So I think this is a much better way of looking at time to event. And I say time to event because it works for anything like this. So you can do time to first comment. You can do time to returning contributor. So like how oft, how quickly does a first time contributor come and give you your second contribution, if ever, you don't know. Any time where there's a chance when you take a look at the data that some of that data is incomplete, this will work. Um, and it's a really, really useful tool. So I think what's important here is that this is a better tool than just taking a mean, but I would never ask the community to go out and calculate these things for themselves. If you do care about just taking the mean, there are a hundred GitHub parsing tools out there that will give you a mean time to close, and it will work and it will be wrong. But I can give you this. So let me give you a demo. I'm gonna show you now what that looks like. So let me fire up this. So this is on stats.eng.ansible.com. Um, more apps will be added here in due course, but for now there's just the collections metrics. This data is updated daily, thanks to a script I got from Civil, so thank you very much, Civil. Um, and the data gets dumped into Mongo, and then we parse it. So, there's a graph you've already seen. Let me show you the graph you've already seen. There we go. There we go. So that's the graph I was just showing you. I cut, literally cut and pasted it out of this dashboard into my talk. But there's more information here. So you can come here as a maintainer. You can come here. You can have a look at, uh, at your collection. You'll get some summary information from GitHub, which you could get from GitHub anyway. But hey, I might as well put it in one place. You've got your survival curves for, for time to close. Um, an important nuance here is that this is time to close for PRs. I'm assuming merged is the same as closed because PRs have two end states, right? Issues only have one end state. They're open for a while and then they get closed. PRs have two end states, which is either that they're merged or they're rejected. Um, that makes the analysis harder and I do plan to come back to that at some point. It's called a competing hazard or competing risk. Um, and so that makes it tricky. So for now we're assuming that they just have one end state and that merged is the same as closed but it's probably not true. I would argue that things that get closed probably stay open for longer than things that get merged. Anyway, also there's some filtering. I generally try and pick the main branch of the repo. So if you've got like some test branches where you're running things and you're getting PRs merged very quickly, it hopefully won't affect your metrics, but just watch out for that. If you're seeing data that looks like it's wrong, get in touch with me and I'll have a look at your collection and find out if there's a problem or whether that's really the truth. Then we've got a table of labels. Again, labels are interesting because you can get a look at labels in GitHub, but it's often quite difficult to get a list of all your labels, particularly broken down by the state of the issue or the pull request. So you can get a nice little table of labels here, which may be useful to you. There's a sort of backlog view here of open and closed issues over the last couple of months. Um, so again, you can look at that. And then finally, there's this graph here. Now this is fake data at the moment because I literally only finished building this last week. Uh, the idea here is that we take this table, these medians, and we plot them over time here. 
So we, we record them every week and then we plot how they're changing. And that's important. I mentioned how for Community General in particular, we're interested in tracking that uh, time to merge because if it's going up and up and up, just like Core did, then we want to know about it. And since I'm going to be doing it for Community General, I might as well do it for every collection. So you'll be able to come here and have a look at how your time to merge is changing. There is more. You can also look at your time to first comment. This is particularly interested uh, if you want to be a responsive maintainer. This is where you want to come. And you can see the data is much better for Grafana here. They're getting first comments almost right away. That makes me suspect I've missed a bot in my code somewhere. I've tried to filter out all the bots uh, that I know about, but you know, Sometimes you miss a few. Uh, so let me know if you if you think I'm missing a bot or something. Um, but you know, it seems like the first comment is about seven days, um, which is not terrible. To be clear here, this filters out bots and the author of the issue. So you can't reply to yourself to gain the statistics. We also have some data on releases. Um, you can't really do survival analysis with this for reasons that are not worth going into. Um, but what I am doing is just trying to get a picture of how long it's been since a particular release. So the black line is the median. Um, across all of the releases. Again, I'm filtering out things like dev, experimental, beta, words like that in the release string, just trying to get actual releases. And and if, uh, let me try and pick, let me do something like uh, Community General. There we go, so you can see it's different, but oh, hello, I missed out. There's some strings I've missed there, lovely. Oh, that's what you get for beta code, right? Um, and there you go, here's one that's underneath the median, so it's in blue if it's underneath the median. This is um, all just tooling to help people understand what's going on in their collections. Now, and I'll just uh, talk about where we're going with this. So the idea of these uh, is partly to give maintainers tools to help with their own collections, but also for us to be able to build an overall picture of the community of collections. And it's important to say this is not about trying to call people out. It's not about trying to, to uh, point fingers at people. It's about being able to ask things like, do you need help? Or you're doing awesomely, how do we learn from you? Or does something look unmaintained? And I don't mean that in an automated way. This is not tools this is tools for humans, not automated tooling that gets to make decisions for us. Right? I, I really, really like building tools for humans. So this is about trying to put heuristics in place that say things like, is this unmaintained or is it just stable? Is it doing really well? Is it possibly needing another maintainer? Is there burnout? Are there signs of burnout? Things like this. So that's where I'm trying to get to. Those tables are not ready yet, unfortunately. Um, but that's what I hope to show off in a future virtual com contributor summit. Uh, and stay tuned. I'll be talking about this uh, in the community. Uh, I'm generally giving stats updates in the Wednesday meetings on IRC. So if you're interested in this, come along to the meetings, have a chat with me. You can also pop along to the GitHub repo for the app, which I had on the previous slide, uh, and open issues with me if you want to have a dialogue about metrics you'd like to see or something that looks broken. By all means, come and tell me. So where do I want to get to? We've had, it's been a year since we announced collections, and things have changed drastically in the Ansible landscape. Next year, it will have been over a year since collections were started. They, they kind of started in March this year and two years since we made the announcement. That's when I want to look back and do a retrospective and ask, did it work? And so you can stay tuned for that. I will have a whole bunch of statistics that are comparing how things were before to how they are now. Total amounts of contribution, contributors, various distribution graphs, that kind of thing. Uh, so absolutely stay tuned for that. Also, um, slightly sooner, um, there will be a survey going out as part of Contribute to Summit, which there always is. Uh, I've already done two of these. This is the third one. Please fill it in. It helps me immensely uh, in trying to understand the community and give advice to my colleagues. Um, and for the next Contribute to Summit, I am planning to do a talk entirely on the survey data. So if you're interested on how we use that data, what sort of questions we can answer with it, then come along and I will talk a lot more about that. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and I will see you again. All right, we have Greg live and ready to answer any more questions. I see very uh, active discussion already in chat. <laughs> but yeah, Greg, feel free to highlight something or. Uh, I, I guess I can summarize a bit of the chat for, for those that haven't been keeping up. So I guess there's a few points going on. We've been talking a little bit about the survival curves and they are a little tricky to understand. Um, Jeff made an excellent point. 
Um, but the, the idea here is, as, as I said in the video, you, you want that curve to be nice and sharp, right? The, the idea is that, that the sharper and higher up it is, the, the more of your issues are getting merged in a fast time, right? or closed in a fast time, I should say. Um, so that's that's th those soil curves are super super useful um, because they are so much they, they densely contain so much more information than a single number will give you from most tooling right and that's why I love them so much um, and why I present them a lot because I really want to get this across um, because it, it allows you to to get much more information about how much how many of your issues or so we say what percentage of your issues are getting done quickly, but what's that long tail look like as well? Is it a fat tail? Is it like 25% of your issues that are just dragging on forever? Is it more like 5%? That's useful information, right? That's information you won't get from a mean. So um, so I really love those things. The other thing we've been talking a bit about is um, about how it's important to look at the aggregate as well. So Toshio was just saying how um, it, it's going to matter to, to so, so, so a lot of this data shows that Things are getting better. That you know, we what we had in core was not great, as I said in the video. And things are getting better. Fine to merge is getting better in a lot of places, but not everywhere. And so the next thing that I'm working on is is to start summarizing some of that information. Now it's hard to summarize, as we just said with means versus survival curves. As soon as you summarize, you lose information, right? Uh, but but we need something. No one's going to sit with that tool that I showed and go through every collection one at a time and try and build some kind of comparison by hand, right? So I've got to produce something here, uh, which is mainly I think for our team. But anyone else who wants to go and look at it as well, and and again, it's not about pointing fingers at people. It's not about saying you're doing terribly, uh, but it is about saying this community is doing awesomely well. What are they doing right? Or you know, how have they broken my system? Um, uh, or 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 this community maybe needs some help. Maybe there's some burnout, some struggling. We need to go and look at that. And like overall, is it working? Is it better than where we were? And so that's what what I'll be working on um, in the next month or two. Interesting. What else is being said here? Oh, thanks, Jeff. That's really nice. <laughs> I'm glad people like it. It's it's not always easy to do statistics presentations without um, boring the pants off people, because I do care a lot about things like distributions and stuff and picking the right one and lots of very nerdy questions like this. Um, and I try and take that away and just give you the, the, the results of it rather than the nitty gritty because I guess nobody cares um, but if you've got thoughts please as I said do come and come and chat I love to hear what people particularly for these tools that are community facing I want to know what's missing if you find yourself thinking oh if I only knew this or if there was some way to look at that then come and talk to me because I'll have ideas maybe a different way of looking at it maybe a different take on it or something we can build something I can put it on the tool lots of positive comments for your presentation I'm just going to answer Andreas there. To say it must have been close to impossible to do all these things responsible, I hope you mean actually getting the things that the community are doing, because then you're right. Calculating the statistics responsible is easy. It's just a bigger number. There were 11,000 PRs. Uh, as I say, the uh, time to merge that I said in the video, what, that I didn't give you the key piece of information, which now you've seen the video, you can appreciate. The time to merge that I was saying of 50 to, uh, 70 to 90 days by mid-2019, that was at the 80% level. If you'd taken the mean, you'd still have got a time to merge for about five days, which is why it's not so easy to see. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, that was the bit I was tracking, was what was the 80% line on those curves, um, which is I'm going to do that again because I think that's a much better um, way of looking at communities. Like, we want most people to have a good experience. I'm just having a look here. There's a question here um, about uh, dependency issues. Um, let's see. How do core developers? So, the, so the question is, how do core developers test the effect of the changes? Um, I have no, idea. I can't answer that question because that's more about the, the code side of things than the statistics. Um, but if there's changes in core that are affecting collections, I'm guessing Toshio might be able to answer that. I know he's here. Um, but yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, if Jimmy is here, he would know a lot better than me. Um, Brian Coca might have a chance of being able to answer that too. Uh, they're both on the core team right now. Jimmy is kind of in charge of it. Uh, and I have been on the community team since before we actually split off collections. So I'm not sure how things have changed. I would yeah, say, I would... oh, Go ahead, Jimmy. Jimmy is here, okay. Yeah, I was just rereading the question to make sure I got it. Um, I would say, Generally, the collections have their own dependencies, and we, you know, they don't really cross the boundaries too much. Um, so everything they need is kind of in their own module utilities file. Module utils, if people are familiar with that, it's kind of one of the ways that we have module share code. 
so we, I don't think we've really had too much of a problem with dependencies, um, uh, you know, as far as splitting things into collections. But yeah, kind of what some people are answering, it's, you know, we, we try and make sure we catch any problems with lots of CI testing for things that are still shipping with Ansible. Hopefully that answers okay. your question. Greg, if you can, are you going to elaborate? If you can think of a a way to to test how those interactions might have gained more friction, that would probably be a good report for next. Uh, I have no <laughs> idea how to test that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think about that one for a while. Um, what do I? Yeah. Okay, um, so I guess that seems to be all the questions. Um, I will be around on Thursday as well if anyone wants to, to mess about with statistics or plot random curves. I do. I quite like doing like data hacking live, so if people want to mess about with stuff, I'll be happy to do that. All right, thanks, Greg, and everyone. If there are no further questions on the talks, um, Gondolo, let's uh, wrap up today. This... Okay, first I will share, oh, there's a new poll. Please uh, take a look. And for those of you, I think many of you have signed up for day two as well, but uh, in case you have not, in chat and also you should see a pop-up banner just in case you missed the chat link uh, for the Contributor Summit Wiki, where you can find registration link for day two if you have not registered. Uh, yes, Gandalo, would you like to add anything? Before you go, please uh, vote on the poll, the final poll that we have for today. And definitely we will share the links. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, just once again, I wanted to say thank you so much to everyone that's taken the time out of their day to, to join us. You know, there's still 183 people online. Uh, maybe that's some, some extra people that weren't here this morning given time zones. It, it's been really interesting to me. There's been a lot of great um, chat and Q&A. Um, as always, a, a contributor summit, I go home with a much longer to-do list. Um, but that, that's really good, right? That's what this event is all about. It's not an Ansible event. It's not a not my event. It's an opportunity for, for me to understand what everyone's thinking about and, and where we need to improve in ideas, right? Um, to that end, on the feedback on Catacoda, 47 people have taken the time to add their thoughts onto that, which is Absolutely amazing. Um, uh, I'll be selecting some people from there uh, randomly um, to, to give some special swag to, uh, some really good bits of feedback. Also, someone sent me a pull request, that repository, to add a, to clarify some of the examples and give a better way of running Ansible tests. And I think that, that perfectly shows um, what the community is about. Um, so brilliant. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll send out a link, um, an email after the event, probably be next week because uh, we're all off on Friday and catching up with sleep. Um, link to the, the videos once we've got those processed. Um, main um, areas that we talked about, we've got direct links to some of the slides and the call to action and the different ways that people can get involved. Um, yeah, um, feel free to reach out to me directly, gundalo at redhat.com or find me on ILC or GitHub or whatever. Um, I hope to see a lot more of you in the future. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Gandalo. Um, Tosho mentioned maybe we can say something on how day two will be different. Would you like to take that? Yeah, that's a very good call. Uh, thanks. Um, how do I put this? Today has been a gentle, gentle introduction to the Ansible community. Um, Thursday will be a lot more technical. Um, we will be, let me just bring up the agenda. 
on Thursday we'll be so today's been more about um, pushing information out and getting some feedback from from you all uh, Thursday is more about talking about the future direction how we're going to use things we're going to talk for example about um, the policy around Ansible 2.11 should we be accepting new collections into there um, is there a limit on the size of that um, what is the testing requirement uh, what license do they need to have what is the full checklist do we need to make sure that every collection has a certain number of maintainers um, or a certain amount of users you know we're going to get a lot more detailed um, what we're also going to do um, which may be interesting to a lot more of the, the group is we're going to do sort of 15 minute updates on a few different areas so uh, we're going to do a update uh, on on documentation on what's changed um, given a split to uh, collections you may notice slightly different URLs and a bit about what the future holds uh, similarly the content team so that's the the couple of groups of um, few teams including networking windows and cloud that are responsible for the certified supported collections that's part of the Ansible automation platform the thing that you uh, buy and get support for they're going to talk a bit about what what they've done and what's coming up next um, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the release candidate process and how we're going to try and um, create this new thing called chaos a great name uh, which is a way of getting new features out to people think of this as sort of like a um, a tech preview or maybe maybe closer to an alpha tech preview way of packaging up um, different bits of functionality to get feedback because feedback's important we're going to talk a bit about the new role argument uh, spec that we're looking at doing for Ansible 2.11. We're going to talk a bit about um, increasing Python on the controller. So that's where you run Ansible and Ansible Playbook, maybe bringing that up to Python 3.8 um, as a minimum. We're going to talk a bit about execution environments, which are the uh, one of the new things being worked on um, to give you sort of like a, a container like system to make sure that um, all of your Ansible de dependencies are in the right place. Um, where you're running Ansible playbook then in the second half of the day we're going to go into breakout so we'll have so in the morning we'll all be one room like this and then the afternoon we'll have uh, probably four events four tracks in parallel so we'll have a networking track um, all about people using Ansible to manage um, a network device and what's happening there I'm going to talk a bit about cloud there's a breakout I'm going to have a a working session maybe sort of a hackathon on documentation on defining new documentation personas and how we want to sort of do a big overhaul on docs.ansible.com really welcome your feedback there and talking about using Ansible for security so it's a lot more involved um, I do hope it'll be relevant for a lot of people but I, I want to set expectation that if uh, you're maybe new to Ansible and new to contributing that it uh, it may get pretty technical pretty quickly um, but then again this is a uh, online event so you know you can always put us in the in the corner of one of your screens and turn turn up the phone when you find something uh, a bit more interesting um, I'll just put a link to the agenda that starts online 77 in the etherpad I've just sent out um, but yeah thank you very much any questions on that feel free just to put them in the chat now um, and yeah if you could take the time to to answer the final poll it sort of sees if we've done a, a good job in explaining different ways to contribute um, that would be really good thank you thanks Gundalo and thank you everyone um, we uh, unfortunately we'll have to end this, but we'll see many of you, I hope, on Thursday. And uh, again, feel free to connect with us on RRC, on GitHub, and um, see you around.